Churn sucks. One quarter, I was helping lead an agency and we literally made this our rallying cry. Churn sucks. We made a huge push to reduce churn and keep our clients working with the agency for longer. There was even a graphic of a sucker fish that circulated on Slack for a while, I kid you not. That push was successful to a degree, but as our guest today points out, there are two critical points in the relationship between your clients and your agency that have a huge impact on retention that are far before the point when that account health status turns red, even before your first QBR with them as a new client. We're talking about the sales process and the handoff after they sign on the dotted line. Today's guest, Jonathan Ewing, is a director and master deal closer, if you ask me, with a large full service agency headquartered in the Eastern US, APCO Worldwide. He shares how establishing credibility in the sales process, often selling the customer what they need rather than what they want, can actually help you avoid churn down the line. He even gets into the specific questions he often asks prospective clients that have led them on numerous occasions to share their live, color-coordinated budget spreadsheets with him during the sales process. This one is a masterclass in agency sales, especially if you're selling higher ticket retainers and customized services when you've got to address your client's anxiety about choosing your agency and sticking with you in the long run. Let's hear from Jonathan about a recent situation where he closed a $2 million deal with a new client by not giving them exactly what they asked for during the sales process. They got us as a referral, and uh, like so many of the opportunities that I chase are, it was competitive, and uh, there were about five or six other agencies involved, and we prevailed. And I think the feedback that we got afterwards was that we were more memorable <laughs> because we put forward a strategy, and the rest of the vendors showed up with tactics that were aligned to the tactics that they asked for. And we didn't do that. We came in with something that was different than what they had asked for. Uh, they came to us with a business objective and they came to us with the tactics that they thought were necessary to achieve that business objective. And what we heard was that everybody came and said, yes, we can do those tactics. Here are case studies of how we can do those tactics. Here are places where we've done those tactics before. Let's describe the tactics and describe the people who can deliver on those tactics. And we're never going to be the cheapest agency. We're never going to win on price. We're never going to come in and, and be individually better than any agency on any particular service. We're, we're full service. There's a, a lot of us here with a bunch of different departments. What we want to compete on is strategy. What we want to deliver on uh, is the strategy that is going to unite all the tactics together and give you a clear sense of what we're going to do. And the thing that I love about agency sales is that this is where the strategy is. The strategy is done before it gets handed off to the account manager. The strategy is done at the top before they put ink on paper because why would they ever sign $2 million if that work wasn't already done before, if they didn't have a clear indication of what we're going to do? And so from the perspective of, of you know, re reducing churn, from the perspective of expectation setting, it all happens up front. Let me ask you this, Jonathan. As you were describing that, you know, you've got a client who Thankfully, they did come with a recognized business objective, not just the tactics. And so you see, hey, there's a fairly savvy client here. They're not just coming with a list of tactics that they want the agency to execute, but it is tied to a recognized business objective, which we all know is not always the case, right? <laughs> and so the things that you were describing that the other agencies did in their sales process don't sound that bad. We can show you social proof that we've delivered those. Here are the people who are going to be delivering them. We can do it at a competitive price. That obviously wasn't enough for those other agencies to win the business over you guys in this situation. Why do you think that was? And how does it tie into what we're going to be talking about today in the fact that churn can actually be avoided, not by just improving your client service delivery, but by changing your sales process. And as we'll talk about here, onboarding. Why are those things not enough in your opinion? When I'm selling, I'm trying to think of positioning. Uh, this is groundbreaking to no one, but how positioning shows up is around the water cooler, is at the top of the Zoom call, is when your prospect gets asked and in one sentence has to describe why they picked you. And that's the positioning that I'm trying to nail. 
not the list of three things that shows up in the slide, not the thing that I wish that they would pick us for, but the thing that they're going to tell their colleague of why they chose us, of why they put their political capital on the line to pick us as an agency. And that's the place that I'm looking for. And when you think about that positioning, that's also where buyer's remorse comes in. That's also where churn comes in. If you get this wrong later on, right, when, you know, you're 18 days days into the month and you haven't delivered because you didn't set the expectation properly or they thought that they were getting a different service or whatnot. I mean, it, it, it really shows up later. And so it's all about positioning up front and thinking in your head, not what do I wish them to say, but what are they going to say to their colleagues, to their bosses, to the board when they're asked why they selected us? I am so glad you touched on that. So often we talk about B2B buying like it's not emotional. And I am of the firm opinion that B2B buying is actually more emotional oftentimes than B2C. Maybe there are some outliers like people who love cars or they collect sneakers. There's a lot of emotion tied up in that. But what you just touched on, the why did you choose them? Whether that's a colleague or even more emotionally charged, their boss, why did you make this decision? You make a bad B2C buying purchase, who cares? Hit one button, maybe you have to drive to the UPS store to return it to Amazon, maybe, right? But if you pick an agency and things do not go well, we're talking about your job, your career, your livelihood, being on the line because you did outlay some political capital in some form or fashion to make that decision. I love your framework there of, as I'm designing the next steps in my sales process, as I'm putting together this, this pitch and the plan for that pitch meeting, I'm thinking, how do I want to influence that water cooler conversation or the next time they ask, why did you choose APCO? How did it go? Why, why Jonathan and his team? So tell me a little bit about, I know that I've seen you on LinkedIn and you and I have talked about, you've got some strong feelings about the actual sales process itself, putting together your pitch deck, those sorts of things where a lot of agencies miss the mark. What are some of the things that really get you fired up or you see folks doing that you think with a few certain tweaks, they could actually nail this better. They could focus on the strategy and they could get their buyers answering that question with more enthusiasm. When someone asked, why'd you pick that agency? Uh, I think the top mistake in the sales process from an agency perspective is talking too much. You get 60 minutes and then you spend, you budget for 45 minutes for you talking and 15 minutes for conversation. It sounds nice. Doesn't actually happen in practice. They get there five minutes late. They want to do 10 minutes of introductions, your team and their team, or someone interrupts you in the middle of the slides. And what are you left with is two, three minutes at the end for rushed questions. That's not great for anyone. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about you know, we talked about setting expectations and I think we'll get into that, especially with onboarding as we're talking about here, the sales strategy and the onboarding impacting client retention and churn when it's so important for agencies right now, structuring those meetings. Are there some ways that you've been able to facilitate questions better or, or change the way that those sales conversations happen, especially when you got a lot of people on the call and time can get wasted with intros, those sorts of things. I, I just, I know that you work a a lot of big deals and you're phenomenal at quarterbacking those sorts of situations. What are some of the tricks that you've been able to use in those situations where there's a lot of dynamics to manage to make sure it's a successful pitch meeting with the client? My goal is to figure out how my prospect is bonused. And that's a pretty aggressive question to ask. And I'm pretty bold, and I don't think that even I can get away with that. And so what I'm trying to get at is what is success for you in the unvarnished way? Yeah, on the individual scored. level, right? On Not the necessarily the company level. level. I think that's a key yeah. distinction, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, you're trying to do expectation setting. And from an expectation setting perspective, they're hiring you, and they know how their personal incentive structure is put together. And so what they're doing is they're looking out for themselves and you have uneven information. They've got some information that you want to get at and they're not going to come out <laughs> and give you the calculation of their bonus structure. And so what you want to do is ask questions that are around that topic and to try to get at this information of like, what numbers do you bring to the C-suite? 
if this program worked, what would happen for you? It, things like this that, that get at the ultimate objective, which is understanding what their personal incentive structure is. And once you get that, everything falls into place. You get strong alignment on what it is that you should be saying in the sales process. You get strong alignment from your team on how everybody's going to show up. A lot of the things fall into place when you have that, because at the end of the day, that's the expectation setting. The expectation is that they're going to spend a ton of political capital and a bunch of their company's money on hiring you, and you're going to deliver on something that's going to get them bonused. I think that's so important and it touches on what we were just talking about earlier is that there's a lot of individual emotion as much as B2B buying is by committee and all of these sorts of things. I think anyone who's been in sales, whether you're selling for an agency or not, understands like you got to get beyond product or service and, and feature, obviously, right? Table stakes. What's the business objective that we want to tie it to? Sometimes clients come with those. Sometimes they don't, as we were talking about earlier. But I don't think a lot of folks, especially in agency sales, are asking those sorts of questions. Maybe not necessarily how do you earn your annual bonus, but I like the one that you called out there and I would suggest someone to you know, write that down. If you're involved in sales for an agency, what would happen for you if this mm -hmm. went well, right? Because yeah. then you can start to uncover their personal motivation. What does success look like? And now you can map to that, which helps you speak to helping them answer that question at the water cooler later. Right. That's good. I like that. Talk to me a little bit about that transition, Jonathan. You have talked a lot on LinkedIn about the transition from the strategy and the sales process to onboarding. And I think that handoff is one of the most critical steps in the buyer journey. Not when they find out about your agency, not the speed to booking the first meeting, managing the sales process like that is so critical and you've seen it done well and you've seen it done poorly, what are some of the common missteps you see there going from sales to onboarding, especially in a client service environment like an agency? It's funny, most of the resources out there for sales professionals are now written from SaaS. Uh, and SaaS has its own different way of doing it in a 90 plus percent margin environment where you have a ton of deal flow. When you move to agency, you've got a fundamentally different setup in the market for you. You've got far fewer deals typically, depending on your size. Those deals increase substantially in ticket and it doesn't quite follow the SaaS model. And so here's one thing that's great about SaaS sales resources is the emphasis on time to value. In SaaS, the job is how do you get your champion to adopt the product quickly so that it's integrated into the into the you know client environment and that it's providing value quickly because otherwise th there's buyer's remorse on the agency side how that looks is we're trying to get in advance of 18 days into the work, the meeting set up and, and the value produced for them so that they feel like they're getting quick wins, so that they feel like the strategy is going, so that they feel like production is set up. Because if they don't, they have this distinct feeling that they just paid for 18 days, two weeks out of a full month of the fee that they're paying you for what, right? For you to get the act together, for you to set up the things. And so I... I understand that there's this drive for uh, consistency in the onboarding process, that there's a need to have a playbook and a way that we as an agency approach that. I think that the reality is that the playbook is not going to capture every environment. It can be a general guideline, but what I've seen be the most successful is having an onboarding coach, is having part of the handoff between the person who's good at closing a deal and the person who's good at managing ongoing closed one revenue also be supported by somebody who helps with structuring the handoff. Sometimes the account manager's really good at this. Sometimes the salesperson's really good at this. Usually you can't rely on either of them being very good at knowing exactly how to do that handoff conversation, at knowing exactly how to take all the promises and the structuring and the strategy that was set in the sales process Process and translate that into how we're going to get the job done. So what are your thoughts there if a lot of agencies, they're looking at, okay, this handoff usually isn't going that well. Maybe it's going okay. We're following the documented process in our project management tool maybe, but we're not, we're not communicating the right things. We're not highlighting the right things. I've been there where I sold for an agency 
and I would record a video. I'd have a meeting with the account manager who was going to take the account. I would share call recordings, but yet it wasn't just sharing the information. It was, I, I learned some of the importance of prioritizing the most important information, not necessarily all the information. So that's maybe one thing I would offer to folks listening to this. What else would, would you say either about structuring it, involving a project manager to help the, the coordination between those two roles? What are some of the things you think can address this common problem in agencies and that handoff between sales and account manager? If you do the sales process well, you get access to some really uncomfortable information. You've asked the difficult questions and you just ask them straight up. And I was on a call, I was on a sales call with a colleague who is much senior to me and, and he was impressed by the fact that this prospect, which is the second time he's seen this happen to me, this prospect opened up uh, her color-coded budget spreadsheet and showed me all of the the numbers in there because, because I asked, because if we're gonna be partners in the situation, they're gonna wanna open the books to me. And that's critical, right? Let's let's talk a little bit about, about the partnership place and how you become the partner. If mm -hmm. you have a large organization who you're selling into that has a lot of external resources, a lot of agencies involved, they can't all be partners to your client. It's just not possible if you have a roster of four agencies helping you deliver, that every single one of them is going to get that inside track, is going to get that inside information and going to be the one who's on speed dial and who text messages. And the question is, how do you become that one? How do you become that special one is by asking the difficult questions and somehow getting them to open the book to you on the sensitive internal information that shows how much they're budgeting for the other agencies, all, all these critical decisions. And you have to deal with the fact that it's going to be uncomfortable and that you're going to say the thing and that you're going to pause just like how you do pricing just like how you're taught to do pricing you you say the uncomfortable thing and you shut up and you let them respond and oftentimes they open up the color-coded budget spreadsheet to you I'm so glad you went there because th that was what was in my head is probably the same thing as your colleagues saying now them seeing it twice now that you got a prospect to open up screen share, show the color coded uh, budget spreadsheet live with you on the call. How the heck did you do that? Right? Because I think that that obviously shows that this prospect already trusts you before they sign on the dotted line, as you mentioned earlier, what sort of impact is that not only going to have obviously on your sales process, but the likelihood of churn with that client? Because as the saying goes, trust is built in droplets, it is lost in buckets. And so mm -hmm. it's so hard to, to gain that trust. And it sounds like one of your techniques to do that is to, to ask that question and be comfortable with that silence because, you know, we don't like silence. And so whoever breaks that first, you know, is just going to start talking. So what I hear you saying maybe is oftentimes in agency sales, we have prospects who might be willing to do that, mm -hmm. but we're not stopping long enough to open the door for them to actually do it. Is it more complicated than that though? Part of it in agency sales is that the budgets are not quite fixed and that they're also very large. And so sometimes anyway, you're helping the prospect make the case internally for this budget and you're helping them allocate how much they should spend. Uh, it's rare that the actual budget that they're putting on the table is the actual budget that they're putting on the table. They have a bunch of priorities. They've allocated, you know, what they think is a reasonable earmark for this thing. And then there's other budget elsewhere. And the question is for you anyway, one, how to access that other budget. But for their sake, you're also trying to figure out how to get them to put the, the right amount of money on the table. And so you have these conversations early and often of, you know, okay, for this budget, we could do this. And it sounds like you also have this other priority and that might cost this. And you start doing the, the shuffling with them. It's about moving to their side of the table in the negotiation process and not yours. Imagine a conference table. You're on opposite sides of it. You're in negotiation. They've got their binder next to them and their binder has that spreadsheet you got to move to the other side of the table to get them to open that. And you sit next to them and you like, look at this together. I taught yoga for eight years and I also taught teacher trainings. It's a whole rabbit hole. And one of the things that, that I help teachers understand is that trust is use it or lose it. You have these moments where, where they can choose to trust you. And if you don't take that moment, 
if you don't take that opening and say and give them a place and an opportunity to trust you and say try this thing and do this thing then then that sets the tone for the relationship the rest of the relationship you didn't have that trust built because you went into that uncomfortable awkward place with them and so you don't have that relationship with them now because you missed the moment I like what you said there, Jonathan, about recognizing those moments where trust can be built because that's your opportunity to stand up or up from the figurative table, walk around, sit next to them. What are some of the ways that you look out for those moments? What are some of the subtle cues? They're different in every situation, but I imagine you're a master at this. So there must be some, some things that you've kind of tuned your ears for. This is a moment where I can build trust. So how do you recognize those? And what are some of the things that you use beyond asking a question and staying silent to allow you to, to stand up and walk over to the other side of that table? The numbers that you generate for your client, uh, revenue, media hits, whatever, Maybe the primary KPI that's listed in the document, but they're not really what your prospect is scored on. Your prospect is scored on what their boss thinks of them. And if you're in sales uh, and you have a number to hit, what your boss thinks of you is pretty closely tied to you, the number th that you hit. But the further you get from sales, right, the, it's like revenue is the sun. <laughs> and then you've got, you know, sales that orbits closest to the sun. And then you got, you know, marketing that orbits further from that, comms over here, product over, you know, it, it's like the, the, the further you get out, the more subjective your performance is. And so I'm looking for what other people in the organization are primary stakeholders to my prospect, what they think of them, what they need from them, and the insecurities and anxieties that come up for them around those other people. And mm -hmm. that, that's the place to focus, is figure yeah. out what do the other people care about, what are they expecting, and how driven are you to please them, and what will please them? And that's the place to counsel them, and that's where trust is built, where they share with you their anxiety. Yeah. How do you get them to, to speak to those things, Jonathan? Like what are the ways that you're getting them to, to bring them up? Or are you maybe sometimes just based on the conversation, maybe you're making an assumption kind of like Chris Voss says, if you apply an emotional label, right? Someone uh -huh. will either affirm that or they will come back and say, well, no, that's not really stressing me out. Are you maybe throwing out some things and saying, well, it seems like this might be the thing that causes you anxiety or what you're measured on and then just letting that hang there so that they can come back and correct you? I used to think anyway that success was about doing what my client asked me to do. And the, the place where that gets muddied is when there are other departments in the mix. And the larger the organization you sell into, the more departments are inside that organization, the more organizational politics they have to play. And so there are these really sort of innocuous questions that have profound answers, like what is your relationship with this other department, right? If you're selling into the marketing team, Team, you ask about alignment between marketing and sales and their face tells you everything, right? They're like, uh, you know, or, or just like it, things like that. And, and that's the door. That's this massive entryway. You just walk right through and ask the questions with them. And, and you're like, because you're a consultant, because you're an expert, they know that you've seen these things before. And there's something really reassuring about them complaining about this misalignment that they have with this other department that you've seen 20 times before. And you're like, hey, you wouldn't even believe how typical this thing is and how many times I've seen this before. And I've got you. Like, I know how to set this up so that they get on board with the thing. And, and you've, you've broken this wall of like them being the people with the money and you being the person who wants the money. And instead you're with them, helping them figure out how to solve their internal problems that are far beyond whatever numbers they're asking you to put on the board. That is so well said. I think you, you dropped a really great question there that you can ask, like, what's your relationship like with sales or throwing something out there of like, I bet the CEO is going to ask you this question. And by asking those sorts of questions, it does a couple of things. One, as you said, it shows that you've been there before. Because by just asking that question, uh -huh. it shows that you understand and you've seen that situation before, which builds trust and shows your expertise and your experience. But like you also said, it breaks down that wall and they invite you over to the other side of the table because they recognize you as a peer who's 
working through these common challenges. So I think to kind of sum up this section of the conversation, it's about recognizing what are the things that stress them out? What are the things that they have challenges in? And even if you don't know them, because they're not things that you can sleuth out by just looking at LinkedIn or looking at company information publicly, but you can make some educated guesses based on some of the things that you've heard from their peers, your other prospects, your other customers, and then you let them tell you, yeah, it's like this, or no, it's like that, but it's not quite like that. But you build trust, you show expertise all at the same time. Yeah, the, the applicability of this advice is directly proportional to the size of the deal compared to your prospect's budget. If Tell they're me what buying, you mean by that. yeah, if if they're buying five thousand dollar a month software and they're a you know I don't know ten million ARR company, right? They're not going to answer these questions for you. It just doesn't matter to them to tell you what their relationship is between marketing and sales, right? But if, if you feel like you have more than 50% of their budget that's going to be allocated through your agency, this is a client who's going to want a partner. This is a client who's going to want to buy that expertise and to have somebody who they can call when they find these difficult experiences. And so just scale that up and down, right? Scale up and down the, the applicability of whether you can ask these hard questions by the size of your deal compared to their overall budget. Oh, that's such good advice, man. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, you're like, hey, SaaS advice is kind of misapplied oftentimes just carte blanche over here to agency sales. Someone could take some of this advice that you're giving, try and apply it to every agency sale and it not work for them. So thank you for providing some of that nuance and context, especially when it comes to sales advice. I think that is useful more often than not, and we don't get it that often. You know, Jonathan, one thing that came up, I forgot to ask earlier, I've been in these sorts of situations as my career path was from journalism to B2B sales into B2B marketing through agency life. And one thing I learned earlier in my sales career is sometimes you will have clients or prospects who ask you to give them what they want. And you know, you want to sell them what they need. And that was evident in that story that we opened with. What is your approach to that of saying, I know you asked for this, but I'm giving you this, or I know you asked for this, so here it is, but compare that to what could be like, there's a few different ways in which you could handle that situation where a clients asking for one thing, you know, they need another, obviously the end goal is to get them what they really need and have them see you as memorable as the expert as you opened with. But what are some of the nuances in how you present that and how you approach that? Because there are some pitfalls there. There's three parts to this. One is the business objective. The second is the strategy. And the third is the tactics. And typically what the prospect is going to do if there's an RFP is going to come to you with the business objective, which is going to be in varying stages of real and varying stages of complete. And they're going to come to you with the tactics that they think are going to ladder up to that. And this is most RFPs, right? It's like, this is about our company, and these are the things that we want, and these are the specific things that we need you to price out. Uh, in some agencies, and in some agency sales processes, and we do this too sometimes, uh, the part where you price this out and do the strategy is you take exactly what's in the RFP, and you stick line items to it, you shove it into Excel, and you say, ah, they wanted two videos, this is how much two videos is going to cost, right? And you get immediately mired in the tactics of it. But there's this part where you're really good at this, where you've seen this before, where you've done this a lot, and you've seen other clients not do this well and get bad results. And so that's the opportunity where you sit back and you're like, this might not be the way to do the thing. And so that's where you insert strategy. And strategy, strategy is not cheap and strategy shouldn't be given away, but sometimes it needs to be. And sometimes you need to do that work in the sales process to come up with a way to unify tactics in pursuit of the business objective. And if you start with the business objective and back out from there and make sure that you go ordinarily from there, it tends to blow up a lot of the tactics. And I'm fine with this because if I give them exactly what they want in a, in a competitive sale and I lose, 
Like, why did I spend my time doing that? I, I'm, I'm not going to win on price, and I'm not going to win on specialty of, of delivery. What I'm going to win on is strategy. And so if I can't be the cheapest bidder option there, then I'm not going to give them exactly what they want. And I'm going to choose to find right fit revenue for my organization. Not all revenue is good. And you want to bring in accounts that are aligned with the things that you want to be doing. And there's nothing worse than having that sixth sense of like, this is not going to work if we do it the way that they're saying to do it. We know it in our bones. We're doing two of these now. We've had clients who fired us because we did what they asked for and it didn't work. And so do you want to bring that in or do you want to take the risk in the sale to say, hey, know that you're asking for this. What we're going to do is this other thing because we've seen this thing work and we've seen that other thing not work. And if you're just like, chill about the outcome, and I say this being in a large organization with the cushion to lose the seven-figure deal if it's not aligned with the thing that, that we want, and I get that not everybody's in this economic situation, but it's like, if you know that giving them what they want isn't going to achieve with where they want to go, then it's on you to, to say, look, yes, it's a risk to not give them the thing that they're explicitly asking for, but I only want to work with people who are going to take my advice. I only want to work with people who are going to give my strategy at the time of day. It is going to tell you a lot about that client. Just a few episodes ago, we had Jackie Hermes on the show, smaller agency than APCO for sure. Yet what she was saying is we were talking about getting to the point of furious clients and she spent most of the episode talking about avoiding bad fit clients in the sales process, in the onboarding process, those sorts of things, because if they're not going to listen to you now, if they're not going to take your advice, what makes you think that they're going to listen to you six months in when you're doing that second QBR and you're saying it's not working, but here's why. Right. If yeah. you didn't start it out with that tone of, look, we have some expertise, we have some experience to bring to bear. And as you were talking there, I could tell you were getting fired up, right, Jonathan? And <laughs> my biggest advice to everyone listening to this, who's involved in the sales at their agency, whether they're at a larger agency, like you guys at APCO, they run a smaller agency and it's founder led sales. If you are going to try to give them what they need versus what they ask for, you have to have some conviction in your voice just like you did there. And you have to tell them why, and you have to give them, I know this from experience. Here's an example of where what you're asking for didn't work. And so yeah. I think it's those two things. If you can bring some conviction and some social proof, you have a much better chance at saying, look, I'm not going to give you what you asked for. I'm going to give you what you need. And them actually saying yes, as opposed to, oh, we're moving on to the five other people who gave us what we asked for. Yeah, one of the things that Jackie was talking about in that episode is avoiding clients who yell at you. And, and I mean, having been there, that's that's huge, right? And and like, please, you know, get a sense of that and just you know leave them at the door. The other client that isn't successful for that isn't a good fit for your agency is the client who has this big delta between client satisfaction and whether the thing works. And it's not that they're bad people. It's not that they're not smart people. It's that oftentimes you do a program. And it doesn't it work. It doesn't like achieve the business objective. But because you did everything that they wanted you to do, they're still happy. And, and I imagine that, that if you work in an agency environment, you, you you like you like understand that this is true. And and that's a that's a client to to avoid as well. And you get you have the option there to be able to say, uh, hey, you know, like we've got a great relationship. You know, you're happy. We're happy. Uh, it's time to disrupt ourselves. <laughs> You know, if you already have this client in your agency, uh, it's a great opportunity to go in and say, at some point, something's going to make this not work for us, right? At some point, if you have this client where it's a good relationship, but it's a bad product and, and it's just like not actually working and you have people being like, all right, well, just get on and give them the report and they're going to be happy and it's really, blah, 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 right? You have to have this sense that at some point that gravy train is going to end, <laughs> that, that at some point that client uh, is going to go away uh, or start asking the tough questions because someone new gets hired there or there's more pressure from the CEO or there's a bad economy or something like that. And like it, it's a moment to, to go in and be like, we need to restructure this. 
I am so glad you touched on that because I can remember specific conversations with the team as I was overseeing customer experience within an agency and we rolled out because we didn't have in the early days, even account status listed on our clients. I'm ashamed to say, but we rolled that out red, yellow, green. And I would dig in because I would say, Hey, what's going on with, with this client. Uh, I was with a podcast production agency, as you know, we, we work together there they're green, but we haven't even published a podcast episode for them in a while, or the metrics aren't really moving there. Right. And what I call that was just churn waiting to happen. Yeah. Right. We've talked about between this episode and Jackie's a few weeks back, churn that's going to happen maybe if you need to fire a bad fit client or someone who's going to leave uh, because they have bad expectations or someone who's going to leave because you didn't set yourself up as the expert as you were talking about earlier. But there's also people who are going to leave who don't seem like they're going to leave, who are okay with the, the lack of results. And if we just say account status is green because the client is satisfied that is only going to last so long. And so I call that like the hidden churn that's just waiting to happen. If you don't proactively address it, you might be able to, as you said, ride that gravy chain for a few more months, maybe even a few more quarters, but at some point it's going to end. And if you're not proactive against that, especially in down economic times, it can have an outsized impact because if you have several of those down economic times is one of those where a happy client where you're not delivering results will turn into a churning client. Man, can't tell you how many times I've been fired by a happy client. <laughs> like, you just remember it. You remember these things and they hurt because you're like, ah, oh, they were happy. And oftentimes you have an account manager who knows that they're happy. I mean, like really, like it takes them for the steak dinner. They're really pleased, great with the partnership, yada, yada. And then six months later you get the ax. And when what happened? Right. What happened was uh, the account manager wasn't aligned with with the business objective. Right. The account manager's job is to make the client happy and it's agency leadership's responsibility to step in and have an oversight on that and be like, I know that they're happy. We have to do this anyway. Man, that is so good. I really appreciate your insights there. And Jonathan, it's been kind of trip down memory lane for me thinking about not only selling for an agency, but then overseeing, you know, customer experience and the, and the client services. Um, just the things that you're saying, I know are resonating with me because I've experienced them both in good situations and tough situations. And so I think our audience is going to get a ton of value in listening to this. And I think the, the major takeaways are whether it's onboarding, the sales process or managing the account proactively. There are things besides just making sure that that account health is green that can impact your churn, especially in the situation that we're in. And it's something that people need to keep an eye on, start to be more proactive about within their agency. And I think you've given them some good tips to do that. As we round it out, Every episode here on Agency Life, we've got our Fast Five and our opportunity for you to give a shout out. So I know you're going to be ready for these, Jonathan. So let's dive right in. Let's say you had an extra infusion of $10,000 a month. We'll say within your division at, at APCO, right? To invest in your team within the agency. What do you think you would use that on first? 10000 a month is a salary, and if there's one person who I would really love to have, uh, it would be a design thinker who's able to build proposals. And I say this understanding that design, that, that, that what I'm asking for is not a designer, is not somebody who is good at graphic design. I'm asking for somebody who's good at design thinking, somebody who's able to jump in at the pitch from day one and be able to help subject matter experts structure their input. And this is huge at big agencies, at small agencies, is you have people and you hired them not because they're good at selling, not because they're good at showing up in the room, not because they're good at describing what they do, but because they're good at doing what they do. And there's a big delta between being good at the thing that you are good at and selling that same thing. And having somebody there who understands enough about the work and also enough about the sale, enough about PowerPoint, to be able to say, okay, sounds like you're saying this. What if we structure it in this one, two, three way? Or what if we you know, remove this thing and have this thing? And somebody who's there as a business partner contributing to the revenue generating operation of the organization and not just somebody who's a graphic designer who TBH typically hates 
decks and doesn't want to do yes. that job. Yes, anyway. they see it as menial work and there might be an expert designer, but they are not connected to the outcome, to the storytelling, to the things that are needed to make that presentation successful, especially when you're talking a $2 million pitch. Great one there. All right, number two on our Fast Five, Jonathan, what are your all-time favorite business books one you just you know kind of alluded to there reminded me of the e myth, uh, the delta between people good at the thing versus selling the thing. So that one came to mind for me. But it's your episode. Tell us your all time favorite business book. Uh, I've got a lot. I've particularly got a lot of ones in sales that I appreciate. But uh, my favorite one, and I pulled this out for the occasion, is uh, the Forty Eight Laws of Power. Uh, the 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, who writes a lot of things. And uh, in, the, in the 48 Laws, there are, I'm just going to go to page one and read a couple of these. Uh, never outshine the master. I use this to apply to case studies. In case studies, oftentimes, we frame the client as this hapless fool who was wandering through the desert and wasn't able to do anything until they found us and we were able to restructure them and yada, yada. And like... It's not the way to do it, right? <laughs> These are intelligent, awesome people and never outshine the master. And the other one here, also on page one, always say less than necessary. Uh, I've learned this one the hard way, but uh, if you walk into a pitch and bring 30 minutes of talk track for a 60 minute conversation, guarantee you have a, a lot better conversation and a lot more buy-in from the prospect. So good. All right, number three, Jonathan, what's one mistake you've made in agency life that you'll never forget? <laughs> Uh, time kills deals. <laughs> uh, this has bitten me uh, more times and much more recently than I would care to admit. Uh, when you have something on the hook, uh, you ought to reel it in and not stop for a beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Rounding out the fast five with my favorite, our final two. What's the hardest part about agency life, Jonathan? Losing clients is so hard. You never know whose fault it was. You never know how to assign blame. You never know how to talk to your own therapist about it. I mean, it's one of those really emotionally challenging things. I lost this one client one time because it, it was a it was a two million dollar a year client, and we lost it because the clients other other agency who was managing $20 million a year in business offered to do our work for free. How do you take that? <laughs> How do you deal with that emotionally? Where oh it's like, gosh. I can't I compete with free. <laughs> Oh man, we need a therapy session on this show. Maybe that's a bonus episode uh, type we could start doing. Uh, just a little bit of therapy on lost deals, the time we lose happy clients, as you were saying earlier, and just let everybody commiserate and join in. Well, number five, we always like to end it on a positive note, Jonathan. What's the best part of agency life from your perspective? I love the variety of being inside an agency. I have worked for so many different companies in so many different sectors doing so many different things and I feel like I've gone from knowing uh, nothing about nothing to a little bit about a little to a little about a lot to a lot about a lot and it's really fun to be able to walk in and I heard this one um, framework the other day that was like the difference between an agency and a management consultancy is that an agency sees Every challenge is an opportunity to do it a little bit differently, and every management consultancy sees every challenge as the exact same thing to apply the exact same thing to. And it's, it's really fun. You know, it, It's a constant tension of how much you're going to standardize the work and how much you're going to you know, chart out to, in a new direction. Yeah, I think that is a constant... I wouldn't even say problem to be solved, but tension to be managed of agency life. So I think that's a great call out. Well, Jonathan, you've been successful in your career doing a number of different things. And we always want to recognize the folks who have helped us along our journey in agency life. So who would you like to give a shout out to uh, with that in mind today? There is a business writer who I would be remiss to not mention. His name is Blair Enns, E-N-N-S. Uh, he writes a book called Win Without Pitching, uh, which is a must read for every agency on how to take competitive opportunities non-competitive and the reason why we shouldn't be competing by and large for opportunities. Uh, it always gives me pause when I'm doing a competitive opportunity, just listening to his voice in my head. Uh, and he also hosts a podcast called the 20% Podcast, which I am shamelessly such a nerd about. It deals with the procurement challenge within large companies and how they try to beat you down and uh, just the real like nitty gritty mechanics of the sale. 
Oh, that's really good. A very niche, very targeted podcast is always great. And I think this show is, is pretty darn niche. That one talking specifically <laughs> to sellers who are just selling, you know, large complex deals and one component of the sale. How do you deal with that? Uh, I think can be really valuable. So if you're in a similar situation to Jonathan, you're, you're pitching large clients for your agencies. You're working these larger complex deals. Definitely another one to check out. So we got two book recommendations from you and a podcast recommendation. Speaking of connecting, following up, Jonathan, I would encourage everybody to connect with you and follow you on LinkedIn because you're kind of documenting stuff, learning out loud as you talk about pitches, the sales process, building trust with clients in the sales process that leads to lower churn, really the theme of today's episode. What other ways would you recommend people reach out or stay connected with you? Is LinkedIn the best? LinkedIn's great. If you're listening to this in August of 23, uh, also search on podcasts for Pitch Chemistry, uh, which is a conversation with the clients who hold the big agency budgets uh, and are in control of whether we get the sale one or not. Uh, and instead of trying to figure out what uh, clients think, uh, we can just ask them on this podcast. Oh, I love that. Well, Jonathan, I have enjoyed every conversation you and I have had over the years, and I thoroughly enjoyed this one and thankful to you that we got to share it with our audience here on Agency Life. So thank you so much for being my guest today, man. It was great, Logan.